this week, I want you to take your Bibles, stand with me, and we are going to start in Deuteronomy chapter 34, 9 through 12. Everyone says, Deuteronomy, yay. So stand with me, Deuteronomy. It's near the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, number five, the last of the Pentateuch. Verse 34, chapter 34, verses 9 through 12. Then please remain standing. I'm going to move right into the first 10 verses of Joshua. The title today is History Makers. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid hands on him, so the people of Israel obeyed him, doing just as the Lord had commanded Moses. There had ne- never been another prophet of Israel like Moses, who the Lord knew face to face. The Lord sent him to perform all of the miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, and all of his servants and his entire land. With mighty power, Moses performed terrifying acts in the signs of Israel. Now, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and he says, Moses, your servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land that I have given them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land that I have given you. Yes, Lord. For the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north and from the Euphrates River in the east and the Mediterranean Sea to the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess the land that I swore to the answers that I'd give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instructions continually. Meditate on it day and night. So you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God, you have called us to be history makers to be the blessing to the nations, to break off the chains, to restore our brains, to give you the reins, to declare your advances and gains as we walk in our destiny with your power. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, I remember when um, the transition was happening here, um, starting, uh, the discussion started in August of 1996. Um, transition to happen January 7th. Uh, Pastor Mather was retiring ja- uh, January 13th, I believe, was going to be the election with me. And in that process, uh, Pastor Mather and I had several talks and prayers. And I remember God leading me to Joshua and he's saying, be strong and courageous. And you know what my initial reaction was to that? Great fear. <laughs> It just was. It was just like, no way. And I remember going back to that verse and and, and to that section and reading, he didn't just say, be strong and courageous once. You know, it says when, you know, in the Bible, when he repeats himself that it's significant, well, he repeated himself several times. And I still couldn't get over the anxious fear of what it would mean to follow somebody who'd led a church for 42 years. And I think, you know, in some ways, the fear was definitely justified. Imagine Joshua. I just, you know, in some ways, I don't think we understand the magnitude of the position that he was in, walking in the shadow of Moses. And there was none like Moses. And yet, there was no fear in Joshua. And as we think about Joshua, 
And the call that I believe that is upon, or was upon Joshua, is upon each of us, that we have been called um, into the promised land. I think we need to understand that just because it's the promised land, it doesn't mean we don't have to fight for it. We don't have to work for it. If you listen to Kim, part of the thing that happened in the transition was in the wilderness, God provided everything. The minute they walked over the Jordan River, all that divine provision was back there. Their clothes began to wear out. They had to fight sickness and disease. They had to provide for their own food. And they had to take the land. And that there's so many other things. The pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day, that stopped. Now Moses himself said, I don't want to go anywhere that your presence doesn't lead me. Did his presence leave? Did it end in the wilderness? No, but it just didn't lead him in a supernatural way like those signs. But it was there. But how was it was there? It was there by God's word. It was there by being in obedience to God. It was there by walking. And I love the, I love the term that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and love. And that God has just poured in my heart in the last couple of months that it's so important for us if we want the peace and love, we've got to do what? You've got to take a right on Righteousness Street, you know? And you don't get the peace and love unless you go through righteousness. Well, all of that was laid in the heart and the person of who Joshua was. So when that day came, he was walking as the understudy of the one. And next week is all about the power of the supernatural. And, and I just want to give you a little foretaste. In the first century, there were those who believed that true, you couldn't reach your destiny with God unless you had a supernatural encounter. And in fact, there was a term uh, coined for those people called monastic mystics. Or mystics. And, and they were monks or monk-type people who believed you had to go off and you had to have this supernatural encounter with God or you, you really couldn't be what God called you to be. And I remember studying that in church history, but now all these years later I look at it and I go, you know what? I, I am where I am and I can walk in the faith that I have because I've had a divine encounter with God. Moses was confronted with the burning bush. I mean, he had a divine encounter with God. In fact, he had many divine encounters with God. Joshua stood, out, stood outside the, the door of the tent, and he, he was a person of the presence of God. While the rest of the Israelites said, no, we'll stay down here at the bottom of the hill, and would somebody just make us a calf to worship? Where was he? He, he, he was on that mountain. And his power came from having divine encounters with God. And, and next week is all about that. And I believe that God has not just one, but a life of divine encounters for you that will empower you. But before we get there, we need to look at this. We need to look at the journey that they took. And so as we go through this, so let's review. He makes... God, first of all, God makes the impossible possible. Genesis 18, 1 through 15, the Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove. Speaking of oak groves, I really enjoyed mine last weekend. Um, I was sitting in it. It was a moving experience because the wind was 25 to 40 miles an hour. But one day, Abraham was sitting at the entrance of the tent during the hottest day. Um, uh, anyway the hottest part of the day, and he looked up and he noticed three men standing nearby. Now, it's interesting because it says, the Lord appeared again to Abraham. Now, just follow me. The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove. So one day he was sitting at the entrance of the tent in the hut. He looked up and he noticed three men standing nearby. Now, this is just an observation you guys can help me with, but I was pondering. So who appeared to God? All right, who appeared to Moses, I mean? The Lord, Right? But who, what did he see? He looked up and he noticed three men. I'm just, just, I mean, just help me here. So the Lord, singular, appeared to him. He saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of the tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on his journey. All right, they said. 
do as you have said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, hurry, get three large measures of the best flour, knead it in the dough and bake some uh, bread. Then Abraham ran out to the herd and he chose a tender calf and uh, he gave it to the servant and he said, quickly prepare some veal parmesan. (laughs) So when the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and the roasted meat and he served it to the men How many are hungry about now? Amen? I am. (laughs) Dinner is next week, not not today. So just keep that in mind. So anyway, he did all that. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt, milk, blah, 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 and he ate. Abraham waited on them in the shade tree. And when Sarah, where, where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. So I'm still working with this, the Lord, the three the Lord, the visitors. I don't know. For me, I I just think there's something profound there. But then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening to the conversation from the tent. So I just, guys, I just want to just dispel this myth, this issue, that it's just your wife. That's listening on the other line. It's always, you know, it's, it's been an age-old thing all the way back to Sarah. So she is, you know, I think the term my mom used to use was rubbernecking. And she is, she's listening. And um, how did she respond to hearing that at the age of 90 she was going to have a child? I mean, she laughed enough so that they could hear her, even though she was in the tent and they were out by the tree. She laughed silently to herself. Well, maybe they just heard in the Spirit. He was the Lord. How could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is such an old geezer himself? (laughs) So maybe they heard the laughter, but the Lord heard her words and her thoughts. Anyway, it says, why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? So the Lord said to Abraham, why did she laugh and why did she say that? Now, here's, here's the key to this. You know, part of what Kim taught was that the, what we see in the Old Testament so many times is a foreshadowing of the New Testament, right? So I want you to spe- specifically look at this next line that the Lord said to Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? Oh, come on, I, I want you to say that with me. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You can do better than that. The Vikings are playing at noon. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No, I believe. I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Now, you can write it down and turn with me to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 36, because I believe there's a parallel here. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth in the village, the village of Galilee to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of the King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what in the world the angel could mean. And yes, I'm modifying the text a little bit according to the you know, gospel according to St. Thomas here. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be very great, and, and uh, he, will, he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord, gave, the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, Hmm, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the baby will be born. He will be holy and will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but now she's in her sixth month. Now what's the next line? For nothing is impossible with God. Repeat that with me. For nothing is impossible with God. So what does the Lord say to Abraham? Uh Uh-uh, nothing's too difficult for God. What does the angel of the Lord say to Mary? Not only about her immaculate conception, but about this 
old lady onto hers, pregnant in her old age, delivering the prophet who's the forerunner of Jesus. For nothing is impossible with God. I'm telling you, when Teresa was driving to the clinic for an appointment and there was detours, and God just kind of used that to say, you know, there's difficult times ahead, but what he's really saying to her is, I know where you're going to go, and I want you to know what will carry you through it is nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is too difficult for me. What he's been saying to Don in this whole journey is, nothing's impossible for me. Nothing's too difficult for me. How did Moses navigate the Pharaoh, the wilderness, everything? Because he hung on to his faith in the God of the impossible. How did Joshua step up in that moment with the strength, with the courage? Because his faith and his courage wasn't in himself. It was with the God of the impossible that he had watched his entire life and never, ever doubted or lost faith in. I had always, when I got to this point in the message, whew, I was talking to somebody um, while I was away, and it was so funny because I, I was talking about praying for Don and how I believe that God is going to completely heal him, what God did for Teresa, and how God is healing cancer still in this place, and I believe it's the calling God has upon this place. And they said, whatever happened with Carlos? And it was just like out of the blue, and I looked at them, and I'm like, how do you know? Well, I remember you asked us to pray for him, and I said, well, he died of cancer. <laughs> it was like, you know, it's okay. But if you don't know, that was um, Kathy Bush's um, daughter's. It was her first son-in-law with Melissa, and, and he died of cancer. And when I was with him a few months before he died, I, I painted his house and stained you know, all the brick and cement on the outside and was helping him. And um, there was a moment where I was up on a ladder and I could hear his faint cry. He was calling for me, and I went in, and, and he was too weak to even pull his pants up. And as I'm doing it, I, I had this flashback to Craig, who was my best friend here, and when I had to help him, I mean, he was so weak, and he died of cancer. And it was the same feeling. It was, I was so honored to help somebody that had to give up all dignity because of the situation he was in. But they never, neither of them gave up hope and faith. And I, I bring that up not to throw a wet blanket on the message, but to say in that moment, I helped him get his clothes on and he was going to interpret for me preaching. And he's standing against his cane and I'm preaching my guts out and I say, nothing is difficult for God. And just like Craig, they'd have these moments where they'd have these like seizures. There's, you wouldn't see it, but they couldn't do anything. And I remember times Craig would be at the, 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 the piano and um, Marlene would have to go up and slide him over and pick up where he left off. And I'd just be emotionally just devastated. And here, Carlos was interpreting for me and he leans against his cane and he's just frozen. And he, he can't speak, he's stuck. And I'm like, it's, it's like the crescendo, the climax of the message. And, I'm give, and so I just blurt out, not a difficile par Dios. <laughs> and all of a sudden he steps out of it and he goes, you, you speak in Spanish. And I'm like, no, no, I don't. He goes, yes, you do. And it was just this incredible moment that, you know, it's kind of like brevity came, energy came, everybody celebrated that he snapped out of it. But I'll never forget that line. And it, 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 I just think it was a moment... It was a Moses moment, a Joshua moment. It, it was a moment for me where God's saying, nothing is too difficult for me. Nothing. Nada es difícil para Dios. And it's just, it is embedded in the foundation of my faith in God. And I say that because it needs to be embedded in the foundation of your faith in God. Nothing is too difficult for God. Here is Abraham, from which the seed of God is going to come and bring hope and deliverance to the world. And he's speaking to a 99-year-old with a 90-year-old wife, 
And there's so many things he's going to have to overcome in his journey. And from the very beginning, the Lord says to him, just remember, nothing is too difficult for me. Mary. Mm. Should have been stoned to death the minute they found out she's pregnant. I can't even remember. It's not written in there. I think it's for her own dignity and grace. But you imagine the rejection, the slander, the everything that they went through that she was going to have to be, she was going to have to endure because she was chosen by God. Simply because she was chosen by God. And so the angel Gabriel the Lord says to her, nothing's impossible with God. Just take his hand and he'll take you through everything that you're going to go through. And before we, I can even move on, I just feel like that, you need to write that. It needs to be in the very, I mean, engraved in this, the, the tablet of your heart that you look at no matter the circumstance or the situation. Hmm. No, this isn't going to, this isn't going to overcome me. The, the, I'm not going to go to the Valley of Ono. I'm not coming off the wall. I'm not going to despair because nothing is too difficult for God. And I know some of you are in circumstances where you're just like, but you don't understand. You're right, I don't. He does. And he always has. And he said it to Abraham, and he said it to Mary, and he's saying it to you. Mark my words. Nothing is impossible for me, and nothing is too difficult for me. You know, God is infinite. When I was preaching at the leader of the atheist group's funeral, I just said, you know, mathematically, let's grasp God here. There's, say, 6.7 billion people in the earth, so pull out your calculators. God is infinite. Even your scientists believe there had to be something outside of time, space, and matter that created the Big Bang. I know it's God. He is infinite. He was, he is, always will be. So let's divide infinity by 6.7 billion, and what do you get? I'll tell you what you get, you still get God. And you get just as much God. And this is the message God has given you today. He is the God of the impossible for everyone, just as much as he was for Abraham and Mary, he is for you. Just as much impossible, not leftover impossible, but total miraculous. So here it is in two passages. Is anything too difficult for God in your life? No, nothing, nada. So be strong and courageous. The battle belongs to the Lord. I believe with my whole heart what separated Joshua and Caleb from the other ten is this one thing. They got it. From uh, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants beyond number as the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of the enemies and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All because you have obeyed me. So it really started with that blessing. Remember that from last week? I mean, that's, that's the destiny. That's our destiny. It began in that moment, but it's our destiny. The miracles through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the miraculous journey of Joseph, the deliverer. It's interesting because I've been reading several books and in this new Lexia Divina devotional, and one of the books I ran into, uh, I ran into this term, perseverance. And I, mean, I was, my mom beat this into me. The kingdom of God is for those who persevere and overcome. The kingdom of heaven is for those who persevere and overcome. Well, you don't understand what I, you know what? The kingdom of God is for, but mom, it's a, the kingdom of God is for those who persevere and overcome. Where does she get that? <laughs> In the word. It's there over and over, you know? So who gets the kingdom of God? Those who persevere and overcome. Well, this book just said, hey, by the way, do you understand where persevere comes from? Now, this is one of those moments where I, you know, it's like I'm mad at myself because I love tearing apart words to get a better understanding of it, and I'd never done it with this word. So you have per, that's the prefix, and when you remove it, 
What, you, what do you have left? Severe. Oh, don't you just love that word? <laughs> so to overcome, I get to go through a lot of severe stuff in my life. Thank you, Jesus. You know, it's like, oh, wow. I think God just saved that definition from me early in my walk with God. You know what I'm saying? Just for my own. He's like, you know, we'll get to this later when you can actually deal with it better. You know, I'm going to strengthen you and make you capable to lead what I've called you to lead by helping you persevere. Now, per means to go through. So God says, how did he strengthen Moses? How did he strengthen Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, Caleb? How did he strengthen them? By helping them go through severe things. That was their training. That was their basic training, okay? They went on to special forces training. You know, they got to love ice cold water and swimming in it for hours and holding their breath for long periods of time because it was through the perseverance he was making great warriors out of them, great leaders out of them. So take a hard look at your circumstances right now, no matter how severe they are, and just say, God is making me who I am through my severe situation. He is. You see, you have to understand that to understand God because we live in a day right now where if God doesn't just pick you up and remove the situation from your life and sit you in an easy chair and serve you, you know, whatever you want at your table, he's a bad God. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. In fact, you know where it's coming from? That's coming from the friends who are sitting in the Valley of Ono saying, if you have trouble in your life, oh no. You better just stop and come down and commiserate with us. Joshua wouldn't leave the wall. Caleb wouldn't leave the wall. Moses would not leave. And when we talk about Joseph is my hero in this story. He started with a dream. We're going to revisit it next week, but he had this incredible dream from God. All you brothers, you're going to bow down to me and so is mom and dad. Brothers didn't like it too well. Um, in fact, they responded to his dream by beginning the process that was very severe. They sold him into slavery. You know, let's see how dad's pet likes this. Hey, you guys, here's a slave for you to buy. Then they took his coat of many colors, ripped it up, threw it in a pit, put some, you know, blood on it, and told their dad he was dead. And that's how his his journey to destiny began. You know? So you know what he did? He just said, forget it all. I'm done. God left me. It's over. No. He persevered. And you know what I loved about the Josephs? I didn't like it when I was a kid reading it. I really didn't like it. But what I love about it now is every time he obeyed God, it seemed like Satan threw him another curve. You know? He gets blessed, he gets to leave prison, he gets to go to Potiphar's house, be this big shot, and Potiphar's wife comes on to him, and he resists, he leaves his coat and runs. He does this incredible, and he goes to prison. And it's just like, where is God in this? Well, God was in Joseph persevering the severe. Are you following this? Because, see, this is what limitless means. Limitless means is that he's given Don everything he needs to make it through the most severe situation. And Don's coming out the other side limitless. That woman behind the camera there. I'm serious. To me, they... Our heroes of the faith. Just as much as Abraham, just as much as Joseph, because it's how, what you learn and how much faith has grown in persevering. And I think it's like Satan thinks he's thrown you and locked you in a dungy cave to die in despair, but you're in there with God, and when the doors finally open, Man, that thing is full of incredible mushrooms. (laughs) 
you know? Great things have grown in the midst of the severe. So we have these miraculous journeys, and, and they're celebrations of God and how if we keep focus and we keep hope, we don't lose the dream. God can fulfill it through us. I'll never forget coming back from Brownsville. We tore the pews out here because so many people were getting laid out in the spirit and healed and relationships mended and sickness gone. And, and then, the, I mean, it just got ugly. <laughs> got voted on again. Uh, you know, uh, we had 104 people leave in one week. Not what I would consider great success. And I, and I was just looking at that and going, God, where are you in this? And I picked up a book called The Three Battlefields by Francis Frank Japan. And I get to this line that says, if there's any area in your life where you're partnering with hopelessness, you're partnering with a lie. I put that book away for 16 years. I just was not ready to deal with that comment. But somewhere, the only way I let despair in is because I partner with a lie because God is the purr that gets you through the severe. And see, when I think of any prefix with, you know, positive in front of it, it's, it's God, it's promise, it's faith. But you replace the purr with anything that's con or against, all right? Or just a D-E instead of, you know, and what do you get? You, you, you get all the negative. And Satan operates in the negative. God is the positive. And so if you lost hopelessness somewhere in your situation, you've partnered with a lie because God has already told you. Principle of faith number one, nothing's impossible for him. Right? Nothing. No matter how severe it is. In fact, the more severe it is, oh, the more strength, the more faith, the more courage, the more character he is building in you because he's got great things in store for your life. These heroes of faith knew that. So take a look at your situation. Perseverance is enduring the severe. So what about you? What is God's dream for you? What is your severe that you have to endure? H have you lost hope in your journey? Is, because it's either persevere or it's despair. Despair deflates the dream. Remember, <laughs> any era in your life where you've lost hope, you're partnering with a lie. So what's the truth? The truth is that he knows the plans he has for you to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope in the future. It's on the other side of severe. So whatever your severe is, there's no turning back or stopping. Remember, there's no neutral with God. There's grabbing that oar, getting the paddle, putting up the sail, pushing through. Why? Because nothing's impossible for God. Exodus is a story of persecution of severe. Let us read in Exodus 1, 8 through 14. It says, eventually a new king came to power. You see... Up to this point, we have these great stories of conquering, and we have Joseph, you know, at coming to power second only to the uh, Pharaoh because he interpreted his dream and he stored up grain for seven good years so that in the seven year of famine, not only could he provide for all the Egyptians, but all of Israel came to Egypt. You know, and they were living happily ever after. And then uh, he died, and then there was a new king. Eventually, a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph and what he had done. And he said to the people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and they're stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from go growing even more. If we don't, well, if war breaks out, they'll kick our butt. Okay, I, I transliterated that. Then they will escape from our country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down and crush them through labor. They forced them to build the cities of Python and um, uh, Erasmus, and they supplied centers for the king. And, but the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites 
multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptian workers, or worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and, um, and the bricks and do all the work of the field. And they were ruthless in all of their demands. And the Pharaoh gave the order to the people, you know what? Nothing they did, if you follow reading through the very first chapter, n- no matter what they threw with them, God was faithful and multiplied Israel. So finally, the Pharaoh gave this order, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River. Now you can let the girls live. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm a child of Israel and I'm living on the storytelling of my parents and grandparents of all the great victories that have come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. And <laughs> we've sat around and sang, my deliverer is coming, and my kids are being slaughtered, and I'm being worked day and night, and we're being beaten severely. I might have a tendency of letting hopelessness come in. We need to realize they went through 400 years of severity and slavery. What's your Egypt? What's your Egypt today? Slavery to the old man mentality, trapped in your own sinful nature, lifestyle, lifeless, loveless, zombies. I mean, come on, how many have had those times where you just feel like you have to work to get yourself out in the morning to go through another day just for it to be another day? Because that's exactly what the slave driver from the pit of hell wants you to feel like. Slave to sin, slave to schedule and routine. Slave to sitcom instead of your savor. Focusing on other, others' dreams and others' fantasies instead of pursuing your own destiny. Stuck in negativity, looking back instead of forward. Thus losing sight of your dreams. Moses was born from adversity. All the other boys are being drowned and what, what do they do? Build a little basket, put them in a river, and they sent them to the Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> they sent them over that way, and they put their trust in God. Just think about it. Out of the most severe circumstances, Moses came. God has called you to be a Moses. He's called you to be a Joseph. He's called you to be a Joshua or a Caleb. You just need to see the God of the impossible in the midst of your severe. Anybody following me in this? Because I've been through some severe, nothing compared to some of you, and I'm thankful for that, and I'm here to help you through your severe, and it's my pleasure. But I know what he has for you on the other side. And I know this. You need to surround yourself with people all right, who understand your destiny. One of the things that, that Kim talked about that I need to get to even though I can't get through the last three pages is that Satan is he's all about the law of the lid. In fact, it's a leadership principle. And that is every time it's time for you to go to great breakthrough, the enemy, you know, he, he brings all of the opposition and the severe back to you that you experienced the last time you wanted to have a breakthrough to try to remind you that if you just stay here, I'll leave you alone. But if you want to break through, you're going to pay a price. And it gets to the point where we don't even see our own ceilings. We subconsciously, we start to feel the opposition and we stop pursuing the dreams God gave us. But other people can see that in us. They see our ceilings and we see theirs. What your friends do is help you bust through your ceilings. David, early on, you know, he learned from a small boy that with the faith in God and a sling and a rock, he could take out lions and bears. And so he sees the great enemy of Israel and he's like, how come nobody will fight him? We have the God of the impossible on our side. And nothing is too difficult for God. And he picks up stones and he slays Goliath. And what does this king do? Tries to shish him, throws spears at him, wants to kill him. And I look at that process, in the middle of that process, what does the king's own son do? Oh, here, you know, Here's my provision. I'll protect you. You know? 
God wants you to realize that it's time for you to surround yourself with people who have your best intentions in mind. Kingdom-minded people. Now, yes, he's called us to the nations, but to get to the nations, you've got to be in the right army. You have to be surrounded by the right people. And when you're in the severe, the last thing you need is somebody constantly making you and wanting you to look in the river mirror. You need people who help you to see the destiny and look forward and see that there is a light and push you toward the light.